I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab one of your Bibles, or grab your Bible, your Bible app, and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 13, is where we're going to be today, we're going to be studying and looking. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Just grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1069, and you will find John, chapter 13. You'll be able to share in our text for today. Uh, today's kind of been uh, a lot of fun because we've been switching things up. We've got uh, our Parker worship leader, Tina, here with us. Uh, playing with our team. We've got uh, Joseph and the youth band went down to Parker to play. We've got Brennan over at McCulloch. We've got Pastor Robert over at McCulloch. We've got Pastor Joe down at Parker. We're just uh, shocking everybody everywhere. You guys, however, are stuck with me. So um, uh, I'm glad I get to be here. The, uh, the Apostle Peter, in writing his letter to the church, says, To this you have been called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. We're, we're in our next step series today. Uh, we talked about last week, we're talking about this week, uh, next couple of weeks. And, and, and here's the reality. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're here and you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, and you believe he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then understand that, that Jesus is calling you to a next step. I mean, he, he wants you to follow him, and by following, uh, movement is required. You, you can't just stay where you are. How, how many of you were ever kids? Okay. As children, did you play the game, follow the leader? Okay. And, and, and if you're playing follow the leader and you don't move, you lose, okay? I mean, you're just lousy at the game. And, and, and the reality is that, that Jesus is calling his followers to follow him, which requires a next step. And, and we want to encourage you to take that next step. Now, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, you're here because, uh, you know, a friend brought you, dragged you, maybe you came to shut him up, make you leave you alone. Uh, maybe you're interested in what we're doing. You're coming to check it out and see uh, if it's for real. Maybe you've got questions about this whole God thing. Uh, we're glad you're here, first of all. I mean, we, you know, we want questions. We're, we're glad you're on this journey. But I want you to know that for us, the next step for you is simply a step of faith. It, it's to begin a, a journey following Jesus Christ. And we want you to trust Jesus. We want you to follow Jesus uh, because he's changed our lives and we know that our sins are forgiven. We have hope of eternal life because of Jesus. And we want you to know that as well. By the way, that's why your friends harassed you to come. And, and so because they love you and they want you to know what God has done for them. So uh, we just encourage you to take that step. But if you've got questions, you want to talk to somebody, uh, we're going to have members of our prayer team here at the front uh, of the service. After the service, you can talk to them. We're going to have pastors at the Connection Centers. You can stop by and talk to us because we would love to help you on this journey of faith. But if, uh, if you know that your sins are forgiven, if you know that heaven is your destination, if you know that Jesus has changed your life, then uh, we're discussing one of those big obstacles in following Jesus. Uh, and as we discuss this, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, listen in, because these are the expectations he has if you decide you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So uh, how many of you ever have been hiking and you came to that place place where there was an obstacle that either stopped you from continuing the hike or or you just uh really struggled to get past it i mean ever anyone ever been there okay some of you have been i'm not gonna ask you if you've never been hiking because some of you are like i don't i don't do that it's okay a few years ago uh, i had the opportunity to go on a hike with some friends in hawaii we're on the island of Kauai. It is an eight mile round trip hike uh to this place i have to read it every time hanukapai falls I'm sure I said that wrong, but I don't speak Hawaiian very well because they don't have enough consonants. And, uh, but this is a great hike. It's uh, to go see this waterfall. It's way back, so the only way in is this one way. So the first couple of miles are, are just this muddy path along the ocean. Uh, and when I say along the ocean, it's along the cliffs along the ocean. So it's up and down and up and down. Beautiful sights, but you can't look at them because if you, <laughs> you take your eyes off the path, you're going down. And it's going to be a mud bath. So we're hiked for a couple of miles uh, of this up and down mud path, and then you get to this deadly beach. And, and I say deadly because they have a sign posted about how many people have died at this beach swimming in, in the ocean there. So they're like, don't get in the water. It will kill you. 
and uh, but you turn there and you go inland. And so you go hiking through the jungle along the stream. You have to cross the stream back and forth uh, and uh, for the last two miles. And we're almost there. We're about a quarter mile from the waterfall. And we come to this place where the path looks like it ends in this rock wall. I mean, it's steep, it's wet, and, and uh, we're like, okay, we've got to climb this. And one of our hikers just went, I can't do it. She just stopped in her track. She, just, she said, I can't do that. She was terrified of the idea of going up and coming down that, that rock face. And so we stopped for a moment. We encouraged her. We you know, force-fed her a protein bar uh, and, <laughs> and just took a moment to uh, allow her to catch her breath and, and decide that she was not going to give up, not going to let that obstacle get in the way. Because she was going, you guys go on, I'll wait for you here. And like, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to make it all the way. And so she, she climbed that, that rock face. We, we went down the other side, and we got to the waterfall. And, and this is the waterfall. It's it's amazing picture. It's 300-foot waterfall dropping down in this valley. We're standing there right under it. Uh, and it was beautiful and, and, and everything. And then we had to do the four miles back the same way. So uh, that takes a little bit of the joy out of it. But... Uh, but she was glad that she finished the journey because what she got to experience. A journey of faith is similar. It is a difficult trek with incredible rewards at the end and some pretty nice ones along the way. But every now and then we hit an obstacle that overwhelms us. And, 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 and we convince ourselves that we can't follow Jesus there. And yet he's always going to call us to follow, even when it's difficult, maybe especially when it's difficult. So one of those faith obstacles, the one we're talking about today, is serving. If we're going to follow Jesus, if we're going to walk in his steps, we have to figure out this call to serve. Uh, John chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, is where we're going to read today. And, and this is uh, written by the Apostle John. This is the, the night that Jesus was betrayed. He was arrested. It began the crucifixion ordeal. Uh, but this is a few hours before that was going to happen. So this is what the apostle says. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. So Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but wash my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him, and that was why he said, not all of you are clean. Now, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, Jesus said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done to you. Truly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Uh, we begin with the example. The example, Jesus serves the disciples. Uh, that's what he did. The job he assumed, the posture he took, the role he played was one of, that the least significant, significant servant in the house usually performed. Uh, think about the context. They're walking most places that they go. They're walking on dirt roads, uh, very few, you know, paved or, you know, uh, rocked streets. They're, they're not wearing shoes or they're wearing sandals, so their feet are always disgusting. And, and the custom was you came into somebody's house and they provided a servant, uh, usually the, the, like, lowest servant on the totem pole, to wash your feet as you came in, to wash the, the nastiness off your feet. 
And uh, if you didn't have a servant, then the host did it themselves. That was how a, a gracious host would do that. It was a way you took care of your guests. Well, no one had done that for the disciples. They were gathered in the upper room with Jesus, uh, and, and no, that protocol hadn't been happened. So Jesus did that job. He took that role. He set that example. Uh, and he set that example not just for the disciples that were there, but for all of his followers by being a servant. Now, the crazy aside, some churches actually practice foot washing as part of their regular church services, kind of like we do communion and baptism. Uh, there's actually a group of, of churches called Foot Washing Baptists. I, look, I don't make this stuff up. I'm just telling you what it is. And, uh, uh, you know, which let's be honest. Right now, if I told you to, like, you know, get down your hands and knees, wash the person's feet to your right or to your left, you, you would think that was strange, awkward, and crazy, right? And, and if you want to do that, well, we have counselors available. So uh, <laughs> here's the thing. They, they took that, you know, out of context to make that part of their church services. That's not what Jesus meant. And he demonstrates this by the question he asks. Do you understand? Do you understand? Did you catch that? In, in verse 12, it says, When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? Do you get this? You see, Jesus asked that question of his disciples because he knew his disciples were dense. <laughs> see, I know, you, got, you ought to be think the apostles were these great holy people and they're awesome and perfect in every way, and you're not like them. But we're like them in a lot of ways. They were dense. I know this because if you read the New Testament, by the way, we encourage you to read the Bible. That's why if, if you don't have a Bible, you can take one of those with you. Uh, we want you to read God's Word because we know it'll change your life. If you read the New Testament, if you read the Gospels, the story of Jesus, then you'll find out how dense they were. Three times, three times in the Gospels, it's recorded Jesus looking his disciples in the eye and saying, hey, Here's what's going to happen. We're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to get handed over to evil men. They're going to crucify me. I'm going to rise from the dead. Got that? And you know what they did? They argued with him. We're not going to let that happen. And Jesus said, you're Satan. Get out of my way. That, that's what he told them. You're, you're, you're the devil. Get, stop doing it. So, you know, he told them that three times. So they still don't get it. But then it happened, just like he told them it was going to happen. And they watched it happen. And you think that any of them, when they're watching it happen, go, hey, Jesus told us about this. Let's go camp out at the tomb. There's going to be a resurrection. No, they didn't do that. What happened? They, you know, the disciples vanished. They were hiding. The women went to the tomb, but they didn't go expecting to find him alive. They, they were going to anoint a dead body. And when they, you know, found out he was risen from the dead, they went and told the disciples. And what did they do? Didn't believe them. That's dense, people. Okay? Jesus knew his disciples were dense. So he said, do you understand the words I am saying? Never had that conversation with your kids, did you? <laughs> do you hear the words coming out of my mouth? And, 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 and Jesus wasn't just asking them. He was asking that of us because we can be a little dense too. He's asking you, do you understand? Do you understand the example that he set? I mean, this is happening in the final moments before the crucifixion. And, and it's kind of a big deal kind of time. It's the night of the, he's instituting the Last Supper, the communion, and all of that. And he wants them to remember this. It, you know, I'm a servant. Servants serve. You're a servant because I'm a master. You're a follower. You're supposed to do what I do. So do you understand the example? And do you understand the expectation of Jesus? Uh, you know, again, he's very clear. Verse 15, he says, For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. He's like, do you get this? This is the example, and I have this expectation. And I really don't know how to be clearer than this, so I'll just say it. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, God expects you to serve people. Serving others is serving Jesus. Jesus served. We follow Jesus, so we I love it. You guys answer that with a question mark. Serve? Is that, is that right? I don't want to fail the test. And, and 8 or 10, everybody else is listening in to see if they got it right. Look, Jesus served. We follow Jesus in his steps, so therefore we... Yeah, we, it, it, we get this. It, you know, you understand this. He asked us, do we understand it? We understand this. Uh, 
You see, the core identity of Jesus' followers is that of servants. And, and when we confess Jesus as Lord, he forgives our sin, God adopts us as children, you know, you're sons and daughters of God, co-heirs with Christ, all your sins are forgiven, past, present, future, even the stupid stuff you're going to do tomorrow, it's forgiven. Uh, and then the Holy Spirit moves into our lives to seal us, promising heaven for us, and he gifts us with spiritual gifts for service, and then Jesus sends us out into the world to serve. So Jesus set the example. He taught, he healed, he fed, he loved. And, and so do we understand? And do we understand the motivation for serving? Uh, you know, I missed this for a long time. I'll just be honest. Uh, the very first verse in, in this chapter, I, I'll be honest, I, I, I flew past it so many times trying to get to the good stuff of Jesus, you know, washing feet. Listen again. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, so he knows the crucifixion and resurrection are coming. He, it says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Look, everything Jesus did is wrapped up in this motivation of love. He loved the disciples. He loves us. He, he, loved, he demonstrated that love by taking our sins on the cross and dying for us as an eternal statement of God's love for you. Everything is love. So do you... Do you understand that motivation for serving is love? We don't serve God so God will love us. God already loves you, even if you're lazy. He loves you. We serve because we know that we are loved by God. We don't serve God so that God will forgive us. Uh, you can't do anything to make God forgive you. He, he forgives you through Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. He did the work that we couldn't do. We serve because we've already been forgiven by God, and we know that, and we're thankful. See, if you love Jesus, and if you know God loves you, the natural result is to serve like Jesus. I say this, but I know this is a huge obstacle in the life of Christians. Uh, in, in my almost four decades of ministry in churches, in serving churches, I, I've seen, you know, it, we struggle with this. It's a faith struggle. It's always easier to be selfish. It's always easier to focus on yourself. It's always easier to take care of you and your family. And yet we are called to follow in Jesus' steps, and those are the steps of a servant. Perhaps it's easier to walk this path if we actually believe the promise. Blessed are you if you do them. Did you catch this? Verse 17, the, the last one I read in this, in this passage. Jesus said, if you know these things... Blessed are you if you do them. Notice he didn't say, blessed are you if you know these things. He said, if you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. It's not about what you know, it's about what you do that, that matters. So, uh, I don't know about you, but I want to be blessed by God. And, and, and I, I say I want to be blessed by God knowing that I am already blessed more than I deserve. Way more than I deserve, I'm blessed. Okay, I mean, with stuff I have, I'm blessed. With the, the reality, every time I hold my grandkids, I just thank God, because I'm I, like, you are, you are so much better than I deserve. E every time I have an opportunity to teach here at Calvary, or I run into you out in the community, and you go, oh, Calvary, I you know, love the church, I, I just go, God, thank you. I, I'm blessed more than I deserve to be able to, to be part of the ministry of Calvary. Uh, I, I, I don't deserve the blessings that I have, but I confess to you, I ask God for more. Okay? I mean, I want to be blessed. I, I really do. I, I, I don't know. Do you guys want to be blessed by God? Okay, well, are any of you like, I'm so blessed, God, you should take some stuff away? <laughs> See, I'm not that way either. I, just honest, I want God to bless me. So you want to be blessed by God, I want to be blessed by God, then what did Jesus say to do to be blessed by God? <laughs> we don't want to answer the question. We know the answer. We don't like the answer. Jesus said, hey, if you want to be blessed, then serve. Do it like I did it. Just go ahead and embrace it. And, and this fits perfectly with Jesus' teachings in the Gospels. Uh, the Apostle Matthew in Matthew chapter 20 tells us that Jesus said, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. He went on to say, I didn't come here to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Uh, 
To be great is to serve according to Jesus, and if you're a follower of Jesus, that's kind of a big deal. The Apostle Peter, who also was there that night, we, we kind of enjoyed his conversation of, no, you can't do this, okay, do too much. Anyway, uh, I love Peter because he was really dense. And he became the leader of the church. I don't know what that says about leaders, but anyway. But anyway, he was there that, right, uh, that night, and Peter wrote this to the, to the church, 1 Peter chapter 5. He says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that, that at the proper time God may exalt you. Humble yourselves under God's hand, and, and God will exalt you in due time. Now, think about this. Why is it that we don't serve? Because, you know, most of us, if we've been followers of Jesus, any length of time, we know this stuff. Uh, so why is it that most of us don't serve? Now, let me just go ahead and address the first excuse, because it's just an excuse. And, and that excuse usually goes something like this. Oh, I'd love to serve, but I'm too busy. Yeah, I'm too busy. We use time as an excuse, don't we? I don't have the time to do this. I'm just too busy. Okay, so let me just go ahead and, and, and burst your bubble. If that's been your excuse, it's just an excuse. Because last time I checked, every single person in this room has 24 hours in your day. This isn't a question of time. This is a question of priorities. Because I, I, if, unless for, you're that one exception and you've only got 20 hours in a day. Then if that's the case, if you're living 20-hour days and the rest of us get 24, I will buy your excuse that you don't have enough time. It's about priorities. So why is it that we don't serve? I'm talking about Jesus followers who know this stuff. Why don't we serve? Well, we don't serve because we're selfish. I'm selfish. You're selfish. I know. I hope that doesn't offend you that I just called you selfish, but we are. Selfishness is the root of all sins. We do what we want to do for us. We take care of us. And here's the thing. We know that God's not for selfishness because you can't be selfish and loving at the same time. And we're called to love our neighbor as ourself. And then the other reason we don't serve is because of pride. We're proud. I mean, basically, I, I don't want to serve. I want to be served, right? I, 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 want, I don't want to take the position of a servant. I want to take the position of a master. That's what we're naturally drawn to because uh, we think we're better than that. That's why we're repulsed at the idea of washing feet or doing anything else that's menial like that. We don't want to do those things. That's what servants do. See, pride says we're better than that. And every one of us, uh, because of our sin nature, has this selfishness and this pride that is part of our lives, and it's there, and we actually have to deny ourselves if we're going to be servants. You see, when we serve people, we step into humility. We humble ourselves. Because when you serve them, you're taking the role of a servant. A role nobody really aspires to, but it's, it's still what we do. A and so when we do that, what we're doing is two things. We're, we're humbling ourselves, which God is for, and then God exalts us. God lifts us up. It, see, pride and selfishness are all about self-promotion and self-advancement and trying to work your way to the top, trying to you know, fight your way to the top, you know, maneuver your way to the top. And God says, hey, maneuver your way to the bottom and let me lift you up. Be a servant and I'll bless you. It, it really is that simple. So Jesus calls us to serve. He sets the example of a servant. He asks the question, do we understand? He promised to bless us if we serve. Still, you know, this is an obstacle in our path to following Jesus. So here's our challenge. Embrace the identity of a servant and follow Jesus. You've got to embrace the identity of a servant if you're going to do this. And it starts with a confession that I am a servant of God. And, and not a confession for the masses that you say casually, but I'm talking about when you look in the mirror and it's just you and God, do you see yourself as a servant of God? Is that your core identity? Is that who you, who you are when you look in the mirror? You see a servant of God that's there? And, and so you've got to embrace this identity, confess this identity, and then you have to actually serve, because it's not what you know, it's what you do. Blessed are you if you do this. So that means you have to serve, and the first place you need to serve is at home. It's at home. If you're married, you know what that means? That means that you need to serve your spouse. And let me talk to the men just for a minute, because if you're married, that means you're a husband, and you're supposed to love your wife as Christ loved the church and sacrifice for her. For her. 
And, and you know what that means? That means you come home and the selfish part of you wants to sit back, put your feet up. You're tired. You, you're, you're, you deserve to rest now. You need somebody to wait on you, give you some food to eat. You know, just, hey, take care. Guys, that's not what a servant does. That's being served. Being a servant means that you look at your wife and you go, how can I bless her? How can I help her? I, if you ask her, she'll tell you, help with the chores. Okay? And right now, all the women are going, that's right, preacher, you tell him. Uh, and uh, and here's, the, here's the thing. Ladies, you're called to serve your husbands. That, that, that's what God calls you. And I'm pretty sure that most, you know, servants that are, that are pictured in that mind uh, were not nagging and complaining the whole time. I'm an equal opportunity offender, okay? <laughs> Here's the thing. If you actually serve one another, it will change the dynamic of your marriage. And parents, God calls you to serve your children, which doesn't mean giving them everything they want. And it doesn't mean babysitting them by technology. It means investing in their lives, spending time with them, teaching them, encouraging them, disciplining them. Look, for God's sake and all the rest of us, discipline them. Okay? That's how you love them. You, you discipline. God loves us. He disciplines us. You love your kids. You discipline your kids. That's part of serving them. So if you're not doing it at home, it's not going to work anyplace else. It's not going to matter because that's your first ministry priority that God's given you is at home. And, and so serve at home and then, and then join us serving the community here at Calvary. Help us promote the mission of Christ. I mean, our mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus through the love of his people and the power of his truth. That's why we exist. And we would love to help you obey Jesus and help us promote the mission of Christ because we're about promoting the mission as opposed to protesting the culture. Did you guys hear about the group that, you know, and the group of, of our brothers and sisters that went down and were protesting at the high school, they were carrying signs and they were using bullhorns and they were yelling at people in Jesus' name? Look, that is not what we do. That is not, I, look, I, you know, I grieve that because we want to promote the mission of Christ and the way that we're going to promote the mission of Christ to, to share the, this good news of hope with about 40,000 people who don't go to church in Lake Havasu and about 10,000 people who don't go to church in Parker is by serving people and loving people in Jesus' name. That's how we're going to make a difference. And, and, and so we need to come to grips with that. And, and maybe you want to serve here at Calvary. Maybe you want to be a greeter. Look, if you want to be a greeter, as long as you like people, we'll let you be a greeter. Okay? It, it, you want to help with kids. Maybe you love Jesus and you love children, uh, and you can pass a background check, then you can work in our early childhood. Okay? Maybe, maybe you're somebody who likes to be behind the scenes and yet have all the power, then you're wired for our tech ministry. Okay? I love our tech ministry because they make everything happen. They can turn the lights off and the sound off and go home, and we, we're just standing here in the dark staring at each other. <laughs> so I love them. They're, they're, they're beautiful people. Even though you never see them, I, I appreciate them. Maybe you're gifted and you can come up here and play and sing and, and lead in worship, and, and if so, do that. Maybe leading a life group or hosting a life group. God's blessed you, and you go, hey, I, I want to do that. There's so many different ways that you can serve. Or maybe community projects are how you want to serve. I mean, you know, we do a lot of stuff in the community. I mean, we just got done, uh, you know, uh, with uh, teacher appreciation where we were out uh, in all the schools in Havasu and Parker. We, we went to 18 different schools and offices, district offices, served over 1,000 teachers and staff just because we wanted to say thank you. Say thank you. Uh, we got a car show like this weekend and, you know, show up and love people while you're looking at cool cars. We, we've got Halloween events uh, where we pass out candy. We, we serve our schools, go in and painting and, and cleaning and, and constructing. And look, there's some way that you can help uh, that, that God's called to serve the community. And then, and then just go out into the community and serve. I mean, bless people at work and, and help people in your neighborhood and be kind in restaurants and be polite in medical offices. And, and some of you are like doing this serving in the community thing like full time and, and you don't have any credit. And that is awesome. I mean, you're volunteering at the hospital, you're at the hospice or the Humane Society, and, and you're just like, hey, I'm out there and I'm representing Jesus in these places. I'm not just being a good person. I'm on a mission because I want to love them and I want to encourage them and I want to invite them to come and, ex and experience the good news of Christ. See, I'm a servant of Jesus, and I pray that you choose to be a servant of Jesus too. So what is your next step to serve? 
See, uh, if you got a bulletin, you got one of these cards. Last week, the cards, you know, had uh, places, you know, for you to put names of your friends that you're going to pray for and invite to church between now and Easter. And that's between you and God. We didn't ask you to turn those in. We asked you to keep those. This week, uh, this is between you and God and us. We want you to turn these in. And one side has a place for your name and contact information. We'd really love for you to fill that out. And the other side, it just simply says, I'm interested in serving in one of the following areas. It doesn't say I, I'm committed. It doesn't make a promise. But here's why we want you to fill this out and drop it in the box. Number one, because God is calling you to take a next step in serving. What is that next step? And secondly, we want to help you do that. And so if you fill this out and drop it in the offering box or drop it off at the Connection Center and you check one, please don't check them all, you check one or two of those boxes, then uh, someone from that ministry is going to contact you this next week. It might be a phone call, it might be a text, it might be an email, but they're going to contact you and just say, hey, uh, let's, let's talk about how you can be a part of this ministry, and, and we want to help you do that. Maybe you're involved in the community, and you look on there and go, my ministry's not on there, I'm, I'm volunteering, and here's what I'm doing. Then do me a favor, fill out the contact information and tell us what you're doing. Not so we can applaud you, but so we can partner with you, and maybe you can even help us uh, gain an avenue to, to get into that same area. Here's the reality. We know what to do. The question is, are we going to do it? What is your next step when it comes to serving? Because the words of Jesus started haunting me as I wrote this, and I hope they'll haunt you all this week. Blessed are you if you do them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us life through the sacrifice of Jesus. And thank you for calling us to be servants who represent you to this world that doesn't know you. And we want to be better servants. We want to have the courage to, to overcome this obstacle. So I pray that you would increase our faith. Help us to trust you that the way to success really is through humility. That the path to blessings really is through serving. And God, open our eyes and our hearts to seeing the people around us that we can serve. Beginning in our homes, help us to bless those people in Jesus' name so that we can lead them to that life-changing relationship with, with our Lord and our Savior. So God, we can't do this on our own. We need your help, and we confess that, and we ask you to, to help us and change us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's continue worshiping our God.